Hey everyone, welcome back to The Campaign Diary. Um, this is session two, uh, where we will pick up the party where they left off in uh, the Vermin King's lair and, and see where it takes them next. Uh, first off, before we jump into it though, I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's watched already. Um, it's been really awesome to see actually a couple of comments and some likes as well. So um, yeah, really appreciate everyone who's, who's already watching. It means a lot. Um, diving straight into session two then, I thought what I'd do today is, is share a little bit um, obviously of the images that we kind of used last time, but also a little bit behind the screen and see um, my notes both prior to the session and also during the session as well, because I do try to take quite, um, quite, quite strong notes during um, the sessions. Uh, but let's have a look at the prep that goes into it um, beforehand um, and kind of see where I thought things may go. And, and it obviously went down one of the routes that I planned for. So um, when I, I, I do all my session prep in Notion, I find it super useful. I can link out to different places. I can have different sections. I sometimes will even drop in, um, you know, uh, stat blocks and things like that if, if relevant. Um, but I would put a bit of an overview of the session at the top. Um, some things that were going to be probably followed up from the last session. So they had a bounty to be collected. Um, but also I wanted to have signs going up around um, a, a new uh, bounty for uh, Heavy Foot the Giant or something along those lines. Um, I think I ended up going for something slightly different on the day, but um, basically I wanted to show obviously the consequences of their actions quite quickly. I thought that would be quite fun to show the world as a dynamic place rather than just, you know, static. Um, so uh, I then came up with a few hooks of different things that could happen um, and some kind of just general scenes. What I wanted to do was not force people down a particular route because the last session was very, very prescriptive. Wasn't sure where this um, campaign was going to go. Didn't know if it was going to be a one shot or a more ongoing thing. However, people were really keen to continue playing. So I wanted this second session to feel a lot more open, give them a lot of choice and, and see what they kind of picked up on. So I picked out four potential scenes. I'm not going to go into all of them in depth because um, they didn't pick up on a couple of them. And so, you know, we'll come back to them hopefully at another time because some of them I think are really interesting and fun. Um, and so fingers crossed, I'll have a chance to bring them back in at another time. And, and as um, Matt Colville always says, that's one of the best things about D&D um, &D prep is that you can put things back in at a different time. So prep is never wasted. Uh, one thing when you're looking at my uh, notion that you might think is it's a very kind of over prepped thing. Um, I really enjoy the process of prepping for D&D sessions. I've actually spent um, all of this evening after work prepping for our session tomorrow. Um, and I did some more prep for it over the weekend and everything like I will happily spend a few hours prepping for a session. Uh, and I know that's quite overkill and some people like to flex and move on the fly. And I absolutely like to be able to do that as well, but I feel much more comfortable when I've got a really solid framework of what I think, you know, the options are in the in the um, in the, the session. I feel more comfortable to then be able to um, improvise around that framework rather than just going very very improv improvisational um, from the beginning. So that's kind of um, yeah where I like to to sit. And also, I, I'm really into writing. I'd love to write a book one day. That <laughs> takes a lot more time than, than prepping a DD and d session, so it's not something that's happening right now. Um, but um, I enjoy the process of writing the scenes and setting them really nicely. I don't want to set my scenes with improvised um, like descriptions. I want to set them with really nice, concise, evocative descriptions. Dialogue and everything like that, absolutely, that can come naturally. Um, but the descriptions I really like to prep for. So let's look at the just couple of things that they picked up on uh, and I'll just hint to some of the other ones that they didn't. Like I said, I broke it out into four different scenes. Um, the Moonstone Keep was really the kind of, I guess the main quest as it were that I prepped for. This was really gonna be the thing that was gonna set off kind of the next phase of the adventure. Uh, and it was really about um, probably the consequences of their actions. You know, one, they needed to take the bounty and I wanted that to be delivered by Reeve, Omen Fowl, um, who I kind of prepped some um, kind of NPC information for up here, um, but also it gave them a chance to learn a little bit more about the law of the um, of the kind of local ruler um, and just kind of what's going on in Everland and the surrounding region. So we'll get into that shortly. Um, having looked back at this, I'm, I've put him down as a tier two paladin. Um, I used this kind of um, NPC generator basically. Uh, I, I actually think I'm going to increase their power, both Omen Fowl and Altura, who's a kind of major lect, essentially just like a, 
a, a wizard advisor for um, the um, Lord Warden of Everland. I think I'm going to make them more powerful than I did to begin with, but uh, we'll come back to that. Um, so as I said in here, this is the kind of prep I did for it. I really like to be able to set those nice descriptions, so I wrote out a description that I was keen to kind of use at some point, and then I wrote out an overview quest hook, an action, um, and I, I put the quest hook as, you know, the hook that I wanted to deli deliver in that they were um, looking for adventurers to go find some um, of this material that they've heard word of um, that has been improving the power of spellcasters, and I had them present it in one manner, um, that they were looking for... Um, uh, to increase the strength of Evelyn's defences um, and the offer that they were offering for that. I do have a secret behind here in that they actually have an additional motive as well. You know, that is a true motive, but they have an additional motive as well. Um, and it's all about the Lord Warden. Um, and um, the party did discover a little bit about that or just kind of hints at that in the um, in the session as well. And we'll go over that um, when we look at the, the session itself. Um, I had a few other uh, other encounters that could have happened within the city. Um, I thought this would be a really interesting one, the rat's nest, getting in a little bit into the more kind of underworld elements of Everland. And I really want to come back to this one because I think um, this NPC here, Emor Ultiman, um, was a really, really cool NPC. I found this very interesting race, uh, the Nazdarun Rakshasa. Um, they have like the kind of head of a... Um, of like a black big cat and uh, glinting gold eyes. They're very, very cool um, race. And I thought they'd be a really interesting kind of leader of a, a criminal underworld. So we'll definitely come back to that one at some point. Um, and then I also had in here, um, just trying to decide, you know, if there were random things going on in the city, a bit of a, um, uh, I guess a bit of a city event in which a, a temple or a, a location within the city is kind of um, blown up by a, a rogue malachite wielding mage um, so again coming back all to the same sort of topic but just other ideas of what might catch the party's attention depending on what they were doing um, then the the burning caravan um, here as well was really because both of the the key um, quests that i was going to put in front of the party were going to kind of force them to leave this the city or the town for the first time I wanted to start them kind of traveling and so in order to not have to plan, plan too far ahead, I basically planned out a scene on the road itself. Um, and so that's what the burning caravan scene was. And it created some really interesting interactions with these NPCs who are from the empire further south. Um, and we will again get into that when we look into the session itself. So that was really how I planned out the session. That was all I had. Um, I say all I had, it's quite a lot. That was what I had going in. Um, and I think it provided a really nice framework. I was really happy with how the session went. So uh, let's get into that. We rejoined our party still um, in the depths of the Vermin King's Lair. We picked up right where we left off um, and um, basically just diving straight back in. They all needed a rest, so they barricaded up the door and settled in for a long rest. Uh, and very, very quickly after that, they um, you know woke up in the next morning and began to head back out into uh, Everland. On the way back out of the dungeon, they did um, kind of listen in to that door where the dwarf had been mid-transition between um, dwarf and were-rat, essentially, and they heard the, the patter of tiny feet uh, and discovered that he had made that transition fully. They actually decided it just wasn't their problem, and so they just left him in there and, and, and moved on, um, which is kind of a little bit savage because, I guess, without, like, any way of getting out he would have eventually just died which you know i guess is not the end of the world they did just kill all the other were vermin so probably you know the right call but just an interesting one there um as they came out of the uh the well itself then they basically had decided as a group they wanted to go back to the tavern that they originally picked up the um, bounty in because they never even asked what the bounty was, you know, how much they were going to get for it, or how to claim that bounty either. They were just very, very gung-ho in the first session and just dived straight in and didn't think about any of that stuff. Um, so yeah, they, they went back to the tavern, the Emperor's Lament, um, with the goal of either collecting their bounty or, or finding out how to collect it. When they um, got back to the Emperor's Lament, on the way there, they had kind of chatted about, um, you know, various things. Again, like I said, the party is already really, really great at, at chatting in character um, and 
just interesting things come up over and over and uh, you know Gleb's character continues to just be more and more horrible even dropping random kind of bombs around um, uh, Gleb having a brother um, called Gelb and that Gleb had actually killed Gelb at some point all this this just kind of off the cuff but um, it's fun it's enjoyable to just come up with that sort of random stuff um, and he also mentioned something about how he hated gnomes at some point uh, which immediately made me change one of the races of a character who was going to come up later in this in the session or in the next session to a gnome just because I thought that would be funny so again picking up on those little things and just making those tweaks on the fly is always fun. Um, we went into uh, went into the tavern and uh, as soon as they walked in they saw a, an Everland militia um, guardsman posting up on the wall, the same wall they had collected the bounty from, a new bounty sign um, for, I think I went for heavy foot the clumsy in the end. Um, and so a few of the party slip into a booth unnoticed um, of trying to avoid the the, the notice of uh, Ghislaine, this, uh, this Evelyn guardsman. Um, and Perry uses a disguised elf to turn into a halfling or a gnome. I think it was a gnome actually, again, to, to piss off Gleb. Um, he turned himself into a gnome and he walked up to the bar to try um, understand a little bit more about these um, the, the bounty collection system. Um, this is my friend Arthur's character. He's an amazing, he is actually a professional, well, professional. He has been a paid voice actor for, for things in the past. He's done some TV shows and things. So he's actually amazing and, and brings so much amusement to, to the session. He um, leapt up to the bar and claimed to be um, I think he named himself Lil Petey and he put on like a heavy like New Yorker accent uh, and really claimed that he knew the, the bartender from last night and tried to be all really chummy. Um, and he rolled ridiculously high on charisma as well. And so um, the bartender uh, was um, absolutely, you know, bowled over by, by Lil Petey. Um, as were all of the rest of the group as well. I think we all petitioned to basically have Lil Petey be Arthur's permanent character now because he was just great. Um, either way, um, Lil Petey un uncovered what the system for collecting the bounty was. They found out they would have to go to the Moonstone Keep and they would have to speak to Omen Fowl, who's the reeve of, uh, of the region, the kind of right-hand man of the Lord Warden. Um, as this was happening, Ghislaine um, turned around and, and ended up trying to question um, the rest of the party that was in the booth. And just as he goes to question them, Glazzy um, jumps out of his chair and goes, oh, I have a question for you, actually, and, and beats me to it. Uh, and he starts going, oh, can you, can you hold this? And he's, he's pulling out basically all of the gear that he has and giving it to this um, guardsman, Ghislaine, who's trying to do, you know, the right thing and, and be helpful. Um, but as he's doing so and stacking more and more things in Ghislaine's arms, um, Pip sneaks out and uh, disappeared out the front door um, where uh, Perry was waiting, having left uh, under the guise of um, Lil Petey. Um, and so they did eventually make it out of the tavern without having any kind of too difficult questions asked of them. At this point then, they headed over towards the Moonstone Keep. Um, they, uh, they went uh, kind of through the main gates of the keep. As they were there, they, they managed to kind of interact with the guards and, and ask them a little bit about the Bloodtooth tribe, which was great because it gave me a, a chance to drop a little bit of lore about the previous war of the Bloodtooths um, and uh, yeah, just set a little bit of scene for future. Arriving then in the Moonstone Keep itself, um, they uh, introduced themselves to Omen Fowl and Altura, um, the Reeve and the Major Elect, in the nice kind of, um, it's not super grand, but it's the Grand Hall of the Moonstone Keep, which is, you know, a, a frontier town's um, castle and keep, basically. So it's, it's not anything of too much grandeur, but it's the most grand thing this, this region has. Um, and they noticed that the central throne of uh, this kind of throne room is empty. Where the Lord Warden would sit, he is, he is not there. Um, after introducing themselves uh, and raising the head of the Vermin King to prove their successful uh, bounty, um, Gleb, out of pure egotism and because he sees himself as right, you know, rightfully a ruler and destined for greatness despite his meager status, um, immediately goes and hops on the throne. It was hilarious because Sasha was just like, I want to go sit on the throne, um, which he did. And um, obviously this was a massive affront to um, the two people in the room and Altura immediately called the guards up and the guards surrounded the party um, 
And while Perry tried to make a, an impassioned speech to rally the guards to the cause of totalism, they didn't buy it at all. They like the Lord Warden, they see the Lord Warden as a, um, a uh, benevolent ruler. And so they basically dismissed everything that Perry had to say. Uh, and Altura was furious that, that Gleb sat on the throne. Um, and in this kind of moment of tension, Perry actually offered a free request of the party, uh, which was fantastic because obviously they're here to, well, collect a bounty, but I wanted them to be here to collect a quest as well. And so Perry's offer was a perfect segue for me to, to go into this. Um, what Gleb noticed, though, when he sat on the throne itself is he actually noticed because of his sticky moist frog skin that he is um he became he came off the throne covered in dust and so the throne itself had gathered dust um, the lord warden has not sat there in a long period of time uh and so i hope that they did pick up on that um so uh, hopefully that will be something that they can um, read into a little bit more and it does have some kind of threads to or, or hooks to threads i want to bring in in the future and uh, so yeah we'll definitely be coming back to that at some point um, once they had offered their help then Altura raised the quest um, that they were looking for um, help with basically she basically shared with the party that um, uh, they're shoring up defenses uh, against a, a what they believe is another blood tooth war or raid that is imminent even this far south um, and they think that the wizards of um, the Everspire um, have discovered, um, you know, writings and murmurings of this, uh, the gathering, and uh, they think it's coming from a, uh, a magical material. And they said that there's a, a mage or a wizard who lives in the foothills of the mountains just north of the town, um, and they believe that they have more information about this. Really, really straightforward setup, nothing too complicated here. Like I said in, the, in my last episodes, we're going for the tropes and we're leaning into that, um, and the party took that up um, more than happily. So um, they did actually share about um, the, uh, the dark journal that they found, uh, the journal of Thordan in, um, in the last dungeon, and they shared about the reference to Malachite. Um, and when they brought that up, they, um, Altura actually asked if she could um, read the, the journal and study it, which um, they agreed to do uh, for a tradesies. Tradesies. <laughs> So they got a ring of feather, Featherfall in return for giving uh, or letting Altura borrow the, um, the journal. At this point then, um, they kind of move off to prepare for travel. Um, they, um, uh, they kind of go secure some, some horses and a cart. Um, and kind of while they're doing this, they, um, they have some sort of downtime chat. Pip shares her experience or what, what she knows of her experience with Perry and Glazzy um, around um, the, the curse essentially that she's befallen and um, how she is looking for who or what has done it. Um, and, and so that is another um, kind of quest, really, I guess, a large scale quest that, um, that the party are interested in. And Perry and Glazzy agree that they should definitely all um, get powerful so they can kill or, or deal with whatever um, did this to Pip. Um, Gleb basically shared that he just wants to kill all of his frog people and everyone, to be honest, his egomaniacal ego quest um, continues. But Perry and Glazzy see that as a um, just a tool they can use in their uh, quest for tortalism's rule. Um, anyway, we headed off into the wilderness, out of the walls of Everland. As we were on the cart, uh, Perry was playing the bagpipes Gleb had um, brought with him a washing basket sized bucket uh, and was lying in it like some oversized man in an undersized paddling pool, um, which was just a fantastic image. And, and Glazzy is riding, um, Glazzy was riding one of the horses for fear that um, if all four of them were on the cart, um, it wouldn't hold their strength. So um, he tried to balance things out a little bit. As they progressed into the wilderness then, very, very quickly, I had them seeing smoke on the horizon, uh, a classic um, smoke ahead on the road, basically. Uh, and after some poor stealthing from Pip, um, after all, she is a rogue, but she is no longer a halfling. Uh, and so her stealth rolls aren't quite as good as they used to be. Um, they came across a caravan that was um, burning in parts, overturned in other parts, clearly had been raided or attacked on the road. Um, they came across a couple of NPCs 
at this point, um, Roderick and Alara. Roderick and Alara are um, members of an organization called The Watchers. The Watchers is a, um, a group of, um, essentially it's like a knightly order um, of people who are roving the lands trying to bring the Emperor's peace. And the Watchers are usually a sign that the Emperor is interested in the region that they are in. Um, they are sort of a, um, a forward party sent to begin to scope out how wild or treacherous a region is um, before um, potentially um, the Empire may send greater forces or um, begin to establish true settlements there. So um, this was a, another indication of wider politics and wider world building that I was interested to see how the party would interact with. On top of this then, Alara was very, very injured um, and Roderick is a much junior member of the Watchers organization. So he was kind of um, having to support his senior and very much out of his depth. Um, so they kind of learned a little bit about the Watchers when they when they um, started speaking to them. They learned that the that caravan had been attacked by um, some orcs and goblins um, that have fled up into the trees, um, into the kind of hills, really. And um, and it was great. that This was a really, really interesting interaction because immediately, obviously, the, um, Roderick and Alara were very much pro-Empire. They are literally soldiers of the Empire. Um, and that immediately rubbed Perry and Glazzy the wrong way. Perry straight up took the group aside and said he wanted to kill the Watchers. Um, he said they fundamentally disagree with what they're here to do um, and um, he he wanted to kill them and attack them. Pip and um, the others sort of talked him out of it being like there's no need to do that right now like think of the bigger picture um, and very terse words were exchanged between um, Perry and Roderick and Perry made uh, and you know my friend Arthur's character made a really um, snide comment at some point um, like very just rude to Roderick who was in this position of um, you know kind of trying to show his senior that he can take charge and, and deal with the scenario and at that then Roderick tried to backhand slap Perry um, but um, Perry kind of rolled his um, uh, well rolled a dexterity saving throw I think and had him sort of catch Roderick's hand as it was swinging up to, to backhand slap him and Glazzy immediately then had his sword raised um, and Alara um, kind of voice of reason in the scenario tried to de-escalate and basically just told Roderick to back down um, and um, kind of yeah back out of the situation uh, and so with that then the, the watchers slunk off um, kind of leaving the wagon that they had been employed to protect leaving it in flame and ruin um, very tail between their legs um, which was really interesting and I think um, that I really enjoyed the way that went down and I'm happy and excited to have the, those characters come back at some point um, and knowing that they definitely do not like the party. Following this then um, the party uh, chased the orcs up into the trees they tracked um, they were following the tracks um, and uh, eventually they heard an argument going on in the trees ahead. Uh, Glazzy actually spoke spoke um, I think Orkish which was really interesting because he was able to understand what they were saying and he could hear a group of orcs um, and goblins chatting and basically um, kind of revealing a little bit about feeling like wanting to some of them wanting to go back down and re-attack the watchers while they were weak and another one saying that they should go back to the outpost um, because they will already be in trouble for giving away their location as it is and leaving survivors. Um, who knows what more damage they would do if they went back to the caravan now. So um, there was a bit of infighting between them and it also hinted to an outpost, which is going to be kind of the setting of the next, um, the next episode as um, the orcs have taken over the, um, the, mage, uh, the mage's tower. And this was actually really interesting how this went down because as the the players or the party and the orc band came into combat um, the players had tried to set a trap the trap didn't quite go down as they had hoped but as that combat then kicked off i described the group of monsters that i had planned and i had thrown in just as you know wanting to create an interesting encounter i had thrown in that the orcs had a deep gnome slave in chains um 
And thinking back to when um, the uh, Altura had given the party the quest of going to this mage's, um, uh, mage's tower, I had said that the mage's name was Kaya Copperbane. And immediately Glazzy uh, had said, um, oh, that sounds like a gnomish name. Is, is that a gnome? Um, and of course, because I just thought it was funny, I was like, yeah, absolutely. It's a gnome. Is that a problem? Obviously knowing that Gleb had just stated that he um, hated gnomes. Um, and I hadn't even connected those dots until we got to this point. Um, and then when the party saw this with the slave in chains, who was a deep gnome, they all went, oh my God, a deep gnome? Uh, Kaya Copperbane, she's a gnome. Is, is, is this Kaya Copperbane? And I was like, oh, that's so interesting. I hadn't even thought about that. Um, I didn't want this to be Kaya herself, um, but Pip cast um, Communicate with the Deep Gnome um, quite early on and um, and had, you know, and asked about Kaya. And the Gnome basically said, Kaya is my, uh, like, my master. I'm Kaya's apprentice. Um, and that, I thought that was really fun just because it wasn't something I planned, but it really nicely tied that together and it totally changed what I had planned then for the combat itself. Because things were getting quite late, we basically just ran through a round of combat um, and so the orcs came in and attacked, um, the goblins fired from the trees and, and then hopped into different trees and, and you know, used hide, um, but I didn't want to go too further in the combat this time because it was getting late. What this enabled me to do then was go away um, and in between sessions kind of change a few things around, um, add some more lore into um, the deep gnome slave, the prisoner, um, and connect that person to the mage's tower and some more information they have there. Um, and that's been really, really cool because looking ahead to my um, session three planning, um, I think it's going to mean that the result of this initial combat is going to give the party lots of interesting things to think about, um, both in terms of um, using, hopefully, if they can free uh, this deep gnome, using the information that they have about the mage's tower and about what's going on there. But also, um, I'm going to have uh, the, the deep gnome have a small medallion of malachite that Kaya gave him once he started employment with Kaya um, that hopefully the players can then, you know, bargain for and get their first taste of using malachite as well. I've come up with some really fun rules, what I think is fun rules for malachite. Um, and I'll go through those in the next episode. And so I'm really excited to see the party deal with this combat, but then kind of take advantage of, of some new information and resources they get as a result of it. Um, that brings us to the end of, of session two. Uh, thank you so much if you've been watching this far. Again, I really appreciate that people are watching this already and, and liking and commenting. So anything you want to um, do in that um, regard is awesome. Likes, comments, subscriptions, all really, really cool. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks again for listening. And yeah, we are playing tomorrow night. Um, so we should hopefully have another campaign, campaign diary video up um, in another week or so. <laughs>